In our previous video, we learned that if we want to take the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of x, this is going to equal 1 over x. But it's important to remember that the natural log of x has a restricted domain. The domain of the natural log of x is just going to be 0 to infinity, where 0 is not included. And the reason for that is that the natural log, or in fact, the log base anything, right, log base a of 0 is not defined, so d and e in that situation. Why is that? Well, when you look at the graph of a logarithm, as x approaches 0 from the right, the log base x is actually going to have a vertical asymptote. The graph's going to approach negative infinity. And I suppose I'm assuming in this situation that a is some number greater than 1. You would get something like this. Um, in contrast, if a was less than 1, still positive, right? So you take something like between 0 and 1, like 1 half or 1 third or whatever. In that situation, if you take the limit as x approaches 0 from the right, the log base a of x, that's actually going to equal positive infinity in that situation. But the important thing to mention here is that whatever type of logarithm you have, at the y-axis, you will have a vertical asymptote. So there's no way of repairing the missing number uh, log of 0 inside the domain. You can't repair it because it, it would have to be a positive or negative infinity, which that's not a real number. No hope there. But what about negative numbers? Like, can we talk about the natural log of negative 1 or something like that? Well, I mean, we can. Um, it does technically lead towards some imaginary numbers. Uh, for example, the natural log of negative 1 is equal to pi times i, uh, which I don't want to give too much of an explanation in this video of why that is. But it, it's kind of like the same issue when you take the square root of a negative. You're going to end up with imaginary numbers. Same thing happens with logarithms of negatives. But what you could do... I mean, if we're going to extend the domain of the natural log, we could, instead of using the natural log, we could consider the function the natural log of the absolute value of x. Notice the difference here is that by taking the absolute value of the input value, if it was negative, it will swap to positive, and then you take the natural log of it normally. So when x is positive, these two things are actually one and the same function. But when x is negative, uh, this will be undefined, as a real number, but this will just be a mirror image of what you see over here. So we can properly extend the domain. So, you know, thinking about this, for example, the natural log of x, its domain, like we mentioned, is 0 to infinity. But on the other hand, if we take the natural log of the absolute value of x, its domain is going to be negative infinity to 0 union 0 to infinity. So it is possible to extend the domain uh, to be all real numbers except for 0. Well, why is that so significant? Well, let's come up to the function 1 over x for a moment. What's the domain of this function? Well, by the domain convention, we can't have x equals 0 because you divide by 0, but it's defined for everything else. So we would get that negative infinity to 0 union 0 to infinity would be the domain of 1 over x. So when it comes to a function and its derivative, the derivative's domain can never be larger than the original function because the derivative is only defined for slopes of tangent lines that are defined. If you're outside the domain, you can't have a tangent line there, the, the derivative will be undefined. So when you take the derivative of the natural log, the, even though the formula is 1 over x, its domain would normally have to be positive x. But if we want to get the full breadth of its domain, we could potentially extend the natural log's domain as well. And so what we will see, in fact, is that the derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of x is equal to 1 over x. The derivative doesn't change when you extend its domain in this manner. This will also be true if you use a different log base, like log base a of the absolute value of x will still be 1 over the natural log of a times x. So let me explain where this one comes from. Why does extending the domain not affect things here? And the reason is essentially the following. If you take the natural log of the absolute value of x, we can treat this like a piecewise function. For when x is greater than 0, it's no different than the natural log of x. But when x is less than 0, if the number is negative, then if you times a negative by a negative 1, that'll actually make it positive. So this function will behave like the natural log of negative x. For which case then, when you take the derivative, so d, the derivative d dx of the natural log of the absolute value of x, what this is going to look like using these same domains is we're going to take the derivative of the natural log of x when x is greater than 0. We know that's going to be 1 over x. But when x is less than 0, we have to take the derivative of the natural log of negative x. 
like so. How does that one work? Well, by the chain rule, what you're going to see here is you're going to get a negative 1 over negative x. Where does that come from? Well, specifically here, this looks like negative x prime over negative x. When you take the derivative of a natural log, so the derivative d dx of the natural log of some function, say u, where u is a function of x here, the derivative is always going to look like u prime over u using the chain rule. And so that's exactly what we see right here. But what's the derivative of negative x? That's going to be a negative 1, like we mentioned a moment ago. So you get negative 1 over negative x, which simplifies just to be 1 over x. And so that verifies our formula that the derivative of the natural log of x is still 1 over x. We can expand the domain and retain the original derivative as well. So if you see, um, if you see things like ab, uh, the, the natural log with an absolute value inside of it, if you have to calculate the derivative of that, that actually doesn't complicate the situation whatsoever. Let me show you an example. Uh, so let's find the derivative of each of the following. Let's take y to equal the natural log of the absolute value of 5x. What's the derivative here? What's y prime? So we have to take the derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of 5x. The fact that we have an absolute value does not actually change the formula which we're asked to compute. What it changes is the domain, which we often aren't asked to, to observe what it is in these type of exercises. So therefore, we're going to take the derivative of 5x, which is a 5, and we're going to divide that by a 5x. So in general here, what you're going to see is just like the natural log, if you take the derivative with respect to x of the natural log of the absolute value of u, its derivative will look like u prime over u, just with a larger domain here. Uh, the 5 on top cancels the 5 on bottom, and we end up with 1 over x, uh, where, of course, the domain here is going to be all real numbers except for 0. Having the absolute value didn't really frustrate anything in the calculation. Uh, let me give you another example. Let's take the natural log, or excuse me, take f of x to equal 3x times the natural log of x squared. Well, recognizing that we have a product of two functions, we have a 3x and a natural log of the absolute value of x squared, we can use the product rule to compute the derivative here. We're going to get that f prime here equals 3x prime times the natural log of the absolute value of x squared. And then you're going to add to that 3x times the derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of x squared, like so. The derivative of 3x is going to be a 3, so you get 3 times the natural log of the absolute value of x squared. And then with the second piece, because you have the absolute value inside the logarithm, whoop de doo it's still going to be a 2x over x squared. Where does this thing come from, of course? The x squared was the original function on the inside, and then the 2x is the derivative of x squared, which goes in the numerator. Simplifying a little bit, you have an x that cancels here, you have an x that cancels here, and so we can rewrite this as 3 times the, times the natural log of the absolute value of x squared, uh, plus, in this case, 3 times 2, which is a 6, giving us the final derivative. Um, if you wanted to, I should also mention that this question had absolute value, but it turns out it makes no difference whatsoever. Because a quantity x squared, as long as x is a real number, x squared is always going to be greater than or equal to 0. So the absolute value of x squared is actually equal to x squared. So surprise, the absolute value didn't even do anything. You end up with 3 times the natural log of x squared. You know, we could have, in this case, we could have dropped the natural log. We can't do that in general. But the point of, I'm trying to illustrate here is that including the natural log inside of the logarithm makes no bit of a difference in terms of computing the derivative. You could also bring the coefficient inside if you were so inclined to do so and see that the derivative would be the natural log of x to the sixth plus six like so. So we do care about absolute values. When inside of a logarithm, though, and you take the derivative, the absolute value will not affect the formula we compute for the derivative. It just expands the domain to be larger than originally assumed.